Welcome back to the B-Sides of Sports Season 3, Episode 6. On today's episode, uh, we're finally uh, addressing the NBA and our thoughts on the in-season tournament. That's kind of, you know, I think one of the more interesting things in the sports realm right now uh, with a lack of playoffs really going on. So excited to talk about that a little later. And also, as always, continuing our NFL coverage. So, Wilson, uh, as we get into our first game today, Washington-Seattle, this was a very important game. Obviously, Seattle needed the win to stay on pace with the Niners for the division and Washington trying to get back to 500, make the wild card. They currently sit at the eight seed before the game. Uh, Wilson, what were kind of your thoughts on this game? Yeah, to me, Washington's been super fun early on in the season, sitting at the halfway point here now. I think we have a large enough sample size to say that that Eric Bieniemy factor is truly playing a role in Washington's success, particularly on the offensive side of the ball this year. And Sam Howell, obviously an untested quarterback coming into the year, the passing numbers have been gaudy. He's now the league leader in passing yards, which is an incredible feat for a guy who most people probably have sitting at below league average, if not just at league average. Um, and again, strong showing today, three touchdowns over 300 yards. And and that Washington passing dynamic, they've just got a lot of different weapons they can put on the outside. I really like Brian Robinson just as a dual threat guy at that skill position for them. Obviously, Antonio Gibson, Terry McLaurin, they've just got a lot of guys that can really get down the field with good pace. And, you know, just I, I love the scheme that the has set up for them. I do think defense continues to be the issue for them. And we saw it again today and kind of a field goal fest. You know, teams were getting down to that red zone area, but really not able to punch it in and convert. But I think going into this one, we knew it was going to be some offensive fireworks. And we got that particularly at the end of the game. If we switch to Seattle side real quickly, Gino continues to just be a completion percentage master of the game. You know, you and I talked at length about how he's been able to turn around his career and really lead this Seahawks team to a degree of success over the last couple of years. And this year in particular, I think their ambitions have come a little bit closer to whether or not they can be a true Super Bowl contender. Winning the division is obviously the first step in taking towards reaching that goal. And for a Pete Carroll team, historically, we know that he likes to kind of run a run-oriented offense, right, where the run game unlocks the passing game. And I think they've struggled at times with that this year, trying to establish who those backs are going to be. Kenneth Walker's obviously been really strong for them, and Zach Charbonnet's been getting opportunities here and there. Um, but Gino today, I think, is, is really the story for the Seahawks. He was excellent down the field, um, nearly 400 yards passing, and um, obviously Jason Meyer, the kicker, obviously put that game away for them. But I think two incredibly fun teams here. You're right. Seattle seems to be playing for a little bit more at this point in the season, but Washington is still competitive and they're not an easy win for anyone any week. Yeah, I mean, I think that kind of sums it up perfectly. Seattle's trying to contend. Washington's just trying to, I think, more see what they have because I think, as we all know, the Ron Rivera uh, experiment has failed. I, I've never been big on him as a head coach. Uh, watching the game, he made two, in my opinion, crucial mistakes uh, late in the game on the game tying drive before Seattle would go on to kick the field goal. Uh, he called a timeout after an incompletion, which obviously, as you know, with a minute left, you kind of need those and it, it didn't hurt him in the long run, but then almost a play later you get the completion and it's a sideline catch to either. I can't remember if it was Gibson or uh, Robinson and they hit down right before out of bounds. Then they wait 10 seconds again to call a timeout. Um, and if they were trying to bleed the clock, it was one thing, but they're on the about at midfield. So just a little confusing. Again, I think <clears throat> I've kind of been a Eric B denier because I know him and Mahone's relationship was kind of strange. The dynamic, um, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, anger and arguments on the sideline, which was a little confusing because uh, they were always, you know, top three offensively. Um, and I get, you know, I get he's a coach. He's going to be hard on him, but little confusing dynamic. But he's really, again, taking this young QB and Sam Howell and really just letting him sling it. He's got all the physical tools and they're really taking advantage of that. I did owe you on Brian Robinson. He's really turning into a dynamic playmaker for them, as well as obviously they have Logan Thomas, who's real fast for a tight end. Uh, Terry McLaurin, obviously, whose role is diminishing a little bit but still really talented receiver. And I'm a big fan of Jahan Dotson. Now he's a non-factor today, but still really solid player. Um, and on the other side, again, the Seattle Seahawks should be competing. They have a great veteran head coach. Their defense is only getting better. Jamal Adams is back after a very long tenure of not playing, and he's one of the most special talents at safety. All the memes about, you know, the no interceptions, things be damned. He's a really good player and uh, kind of like what they're doing with Kyle Hamilton in Baltimore, where he's just so athletic. He's like that Jalen Ramsey role. You know, they call it the star position where they just want him on the ball. So, uh, if he's not catching interceptions at safety, so be it. He's sacking the quarterback at a clip. So most of the ends don't even do so. Just very impressive. Um, and obviously, Ty Lockett, DK Metcalf, and finally Jackson Smith and Jigba coming on. I mean, that's one of the most talented receiver cores in the league. Always been a huge fan of Ty Lockett. And, you know, a lot of people always diss him for the whole sliding down instead of taking tackles. Man's getting older, and he's small, and he realizes that, you know, to be self-aware, but also to still be a 100-yard receiver threat every game is, I think, very, very awesome for him. 
Absolutely. I think Seattle's role as a potential contender in the NFC as well as just with the NFL as a whole is a super interesting position to consider. Early on in the year when San Fran was undefeated, I think people expected them to run away with the division. Obviously, that three-game losing streak makes their matchups um, down the season super interesting. You know, if Seattle can get a win here, um, obviously, it'll make that playoff seeding have larger implications. And you laid it out very well. I think they've got a super young defense. They're super quick on the outside. And that pass rush just continues to get healthier and stronger week in and week out. With Pete Carroll at the head coach position, I think some of the questions do fall on Geno Smith. Obviously, I think over the last year or so, it's safe to say that he's definitely above league average, kind of on that borderline top 10 in terms of quarterback play. And I think it'll be interesting to see as the season goes on how much trust trust Carroll is willing to put in the hands of Gino. He's got great weapons. You mentioned like the aging locket. DK is obviously just a huge target for a receiver. Super nice to throw kind of 50-50 balls to. And, you know, if JSN can continue to make strides and improve as a young player in that system, I think Seattle could be dangerous. You know, obviously getting humbled in a game like they had against Baltimore, t- tough position. But again, six and three, they're in, a, sorry, in position to win that division and securing, you know, good playoff seating as well as just a game at your home field. You know, I think anything can happen once you get in. I do want to say they're the only thing that really scares me about them is the four and one home record and i mean that's obviously a great thing but uh at the end of the day you have to win away especially playing in against really talented teams like san fran in the bay or or obviously other nfc contenders cowboys and others come down the line so um obviously i get the 12 man huge advantage but um i'm kind of on the um camp of i think they need one more year a lot of good young defensive players julian love just came from the giants really talented player i think he still needs a little bit of time devin witherspoon really coming into his own Tariq wallen is having a little bit of a sophomore slump but still a really talented corner i think they have a lot of really good young pieces so i think if they can figure this out come the end of the year they could be a contender or their window might be more of realistic next year absolutely and with that we will go to our second game another walk-off touchdown there were five today which sets the nfl record for one day um this game we chose to cover was the browns ravens haven't really talked about either team in depth so we wanted an opportunity uh obviously this game it was a a very confusing one really felt like baltimore this was baltimore's game to lose and that's exactly what they did um wilson what were kind of your takeaways yeah my first one here is echoing the take of one of my favorite analyst he's one of fox sports's it's nick wright and he's made a point throughout this year about the hot team losing a game after they become the hot team so just looking week in a week out detroit obviously defeats the super bowl champs a couple weeks later the cowboys have a humbling loss happened to the lions and then in this week we see it happen to baltimore baltimore had been rolling as of recent two dominant victories over teams that people have on the cusp of being a contender in the lions and the seahawks and a tough loss today at home considering this browns offense has looked up and down throughout the year and not particularly consistent. Um, I think for Baltimore, just the passing game continues to be the question on how much they're going to be able to establish that throughout the season without relying on their run game, particularly if they get in scenarios where they're down and they're not able to rely on the strength of that run game. For the Browns, I think the questions continue to center around Deshaun Watson. And, you know, a lot can be said about the whole situation and his play. I think it is quite puzzling to see the kind of the news that has come out over the last couple of weeks on whether or not he was healthy and then the decisions he was making, whether or not he was playing or not. I think some of that does boil down to the fact that he does have a fully guaranteed guaranteed contract. And I think when you're in a situation like that, particularly just given the media history that Deshaun has, I think for him, sometimes it's easy to make the decision just not to play. While I do question how that affects the locker room, um, you know, this Brown team continues to rely on its defense. And obviously today kind of got into a little bit of a shootout, but um, I, I think the Browns are the team to me where it feels like you wouldn't want to play them just because you don't know what you're going to get. But at the same time, if you got to pick who you wanted to play in the postseason, I feel like a lot of teams would choose the Browns, given just the limitations of this offense at times. Um, I, I would say the Browns, to me, are the team here that I can't figure out. I think the Ravens, we know the questions continue to center around the ability to pass the ball. The Browns, I just really don't know what you're getting. Yeah, no, I think that's a good take. And obviously with the Nick Chubb injury, obviously, you know, uh, just a real tragic one because one of the most talented rushers uh, in the in the game and probably will go down as an all-time great um, losing him, I get uh, a hard loss, but, um, j- you know, just to be completely transparent, I'm not a fan of Deshaun Watson. Um, and I, I will admit, I don't know if I'll ever be able to fully um, have my biases taken away, but you cannot be playing this bad 
uh, when you're getting that much money guaranteed and the whole being cleared by three separate independent doctors and you still don't want to play. Just a very puzzling situation. I'm all for players sitting out if they aren't fully healed. We've seen how it could hurt guys in basketball. I'm using an example, Isaiah Thomas. Um, career might have been ended by playing through that hip injury. I mean, he can't stay, stay in the league, can't stay healthy, and that was trying to play for his team. Baker Mayfield a few years ago, the Browns did that to him. Played through a labrum tear, and then look at him. They ditched him to the curb, and now they're getting worse QB play. I'd love to continue to see Baker Mayfield ball out and show that he was never the problem in Cleveland. Um, I'm just not a fan of what Cleveland does. Their defense is unbelievable. I mean, I I could I can't sing enough praises. When you have JOK and Anthony Walker at your linebackers, that's an unbelievable core. Throw in Zadarius Smith off the edge, one of the more underrated pass rushers in the league, and Miles Garrett. That's just a nightmare for everyone. Uh, they also have a lot of really talented players and old veteran safety and Rodney McLeod. So, and how can I, for, I almost forgot Denzel Ward, which is blasphemous, but just a really talented player. So, I mean, their defense won them this game. I think you can look at that defense and ground game. They outrushed the Ravens, which is a hard thing to do. Deshaun Watson played just objectively terrible. I don't really think you can make an argument for him. And even Lamar, who I think had one of his worst games of the year, still, in my opinion, uh, played a better game. The one pick, the deflection, don't really put that on him. The other one wasn't great. And again, I think the abandonment of the run game was really confusing. They had such a big league and they only attempted to rush the ball 24 times. And the Browns ran at 36 while being down almost the entire game. So a little bit confused. I think, again, I've been singing the praises of Todd Monken. And today I was just a little confused by it. I get that their front is very scary, as I just mentioned. Unbelievably talented front seven. But still, you're the Baltimore Ravens. You have Keaton Mitchell, who's really just coming into his own, Gus Edwards. And that was, I think, the most confusing thing. Keaton Mitchell was just a spark plug in that first half. And to only have four touches at the end of the game, I think, is a mistake. I get that he's nursing an injury, but I, I think he really is showing to be an X factor for them uh, as the time goes on. Great points. There. A lot of gold in what you just said. And I did want to follow up on just one thing you mentioned. That is your point about Deshaun Watson. I'm with you. I do have a bias against Watson, just given the history of everything that happens. And I think at times it makes it difficult to kind of cover the Browns as a team, right? You know, there's a lot of likable players on this Browns roster. Um, and I think just having the questions continue to center around the quarterback, both just you know, with controversies off the field, as well as just to play on the field, makes it kind of a difficult conversation to have at times. That being said, to just look at it purely on the field, I think it's striking that there isn't more of a dialogue surrounding how poorly Deshaun has played. He's truly played like a bottom 10 quarterback in terms of starting quarterbacks in the NFL this year. And he's truly the reason that the Browns can't get over the hump this year. The run game has been fantastic. And the defense, like you said, is, you know, it's easily top five, if not the best defense in the NFL this year. And I just think it's interesting that the dialogue around the Browns is not centered more around why why they just don't have any, I guess, secondary planet quarterback. And I think, you know, you could just chalk that up to the contract that they're willing to give him. But to me, Deshaun's play has not gotten better since the end of last year. We know how, you know, it was documented how much he struggled. And to me, he continues to struggle. He doesn't have any wild plays week in a week out for me. And I, I think like sometimes watching him kind of escape the pocket and scramble a little bit, you see flashes of kind of the, the mobileness that he offers as the, at the quarterback position, but just in terms of his ability to throw the ball, I'm not impressed at all. And I think that will continue to be the hindrance in the Browns for years to come if they don't do anything about that contract. No, I mean, you're hundred percent right. They have a great O-line. I mean, a very young O-line that's truly just been one. I mean, I'm a big fan of Wyatt Teller and Joel Batoni and all the guys on that O-line, just a really good unit, really good at running the ball. And I get that the pass protection isn't as good, but still to have a guy like Jerome Ford come in after being uh, nobody this year, and he's a 500 yard rusher. He's approaching the top five rushers in the league right now. Um, and again, your quarterback play that you're paying 60 a year average is what's losing you games. That's very concerning because you thought this was the final piece of the puzzle. And instead it looks to be the biggest hole on the roster. If I'm the Browns genuinely, and again, you can say you can claim it's bias or whatever. Um, I know that they drafted DTR kind of high, very unique talent in college to dual threat. I think, he can play very similar to how Deshaun could play. Same thing with PJ Walker. So if I'm the Browns, I'm really convinced on just trying to get those guys um, reps whenever I can, because I think, uh, again, I don't know if they'll ever be able to ditch the Deshaun contract, but uh, it's just such a strange situation and they're a QB away. And you just can't tell me that PJ Walker and Doran Tory DTR uh, can't play at a similar level, if not better. Yeah, the last thing I would hammer here, not to beat the you know the horse dead per se, but the quarterbacks that the Browns have had, I think arguably any of the the ones before Watson would have been better. You know, Case Keenum, Brissett, um, Baker Mayfield. Even they had Josh Dobbs on the roster for a bit. I think you look at the way that some of those guys are playing or just, you know, considering how they would play if they were in the starting quarterback position for this Browns roster. I just continue to question that front office decision to do the Deshaun signing. And, you know, for better, or for worse, um, 
is it's the wrong decision is my opinion no i agree and i think who i feel most bad for in this situation is browns fans because they've really had a tough run of it and their organization just keeps doing it to them but with that we are going to go into our next segment which we'll be finally discussing the nba for the first time this year Welcome back to the B-Sides of Sports, and today we are talking, I think, in my opinion, one of the hotter topics in sports right now, and that is the NBA in-season tournament. Now, Wilson, as a more casual basketball fan than you are, uh, you know, I'm a little confused by it, and I think a lot of fans are. We've even seen players like Bones Highland talking about how they're a little confused by it. So, Wilson, what do you think the NBA's intentions are with it? And just kind of explain, you know, shortly, you know, in as, as a concise way as you can, just kind of what it is, it, it is and what they're trying to do with it. Yes, absolutely, Drake. So we know that the NBA is one of the more experimental leagues we have in professional sports right now. They're really not afraid to try new things and kind of challenge their fan bases and kind of just change the product to what it is on a week, excuse me, year in and year out basis. And this year, they obviously have shaken things up dramatically with this in-season tournament. So what we have here is we have a tournament that's divided into two stages of play. There's a group play stage and there's a knockout round. And the group play stage is designed for teams to make it into the knockout round. Think kind of FIBA World Cup for football. And so what we have here is of the 30 teams, they've been drawn into six groups of five within those five, um, excuse me, within those groups of five, they're going to play four games, one against each of the other um, teams in that group play and based on the record that they have throughout that group play the top record in each of those groups will advance to the knockout round as well as two wild card teams and in that knockout round it becomes a best um excuse me out of eight it's just knockout round whoever can make it to the final and win the game will win the in-season tournament so super interesting concept to me here and again the nba has never been afraid afraid to try new things we know that the nba has lacked regular season interest particularly in the beginning stages of its season a lot of that can be chalked up to college sports as well as just the dominance of nfl and college football and american tv screens and so the nba trying to draw more interest here through this kind of allure of making the players play for something a little bit more in the earlier part of the season, given that across an 82 game season, a lot of teams don't really flip that switch until post MLK day. That's kind of been recognized as the day that the NBA season truly begins. And so to me, the NBA has done two things really well here, the way they've marketed it and the way that they've got their players to buy, to buy into it. From a marketing standpoint, the NBA has done things from both a visual and a scheduling standpoint. The first thing they've done is on the schedule, the, this uh, in this in season tournament group play is happening on Tuesdays and Fridays. So NBA fans know that every Tuesday and Friday they can expect play that counts towards these group play games. Secondly, they've marketed the game differently than they norm they do normal broadcasts. The courts are dyed the color of one of the team's logos, whoever's at home. So if it's a thunder, the court becomes a sky blue color. And while at first it's harsh visually, I think watching a, a basketball game, you're not expecting to see something like that. I also think it's different. And just that factor alone can draw in the naked eye that might be viewing the game casually, might hone in on it a little bit more just because you know the naked eye is able to observe that something a little different is happening. And so I think those things combined with the players buying in, and it starts at the top. We heard that quote from LeBron the other day after that game saying it feels like an extra good win because it was a group play game that counts towards this in-season tournament. Who knows if LeBron really believes that or not? What I think matters is that he openly said that. When you have you know, still incredibly the face of the NBA being LeBron James commit to this in-season tournament in that type of national stage i think it's really important for the rest of the league's players as well as just fans to realize that hey this is something that players are really playing for um and i know i've kind of gone on a little bit of ramble here but the last thing i would mention is that there is a five hundred thousand dollar prize for each of the players on these rosters as well as the head coach and i think for that kind of money it truly matters obviously for the superstars of the league that are on max contracts five hundred thousand is just another day in the office for them guys like steph and kd that's probably equivalent to a game check for them but when you've got rookies on these rosters who their contract signed post taxes is probably just 500,000 for the entire year. I think that some really, really matters as well as for the head coaches, because what you're going to see is if the head coach is bought into this concept, the roster is going to galvanize around the head coach. You're not going to have a roster in the NBA where, you know, if, You've got Ty Lue telling the Clippers, hey, we got to go hard for this. We got to go hard for this. They're absolutely going to stand by him and try to play. And so I think the NBA has done a really good job. Obviously, you know, we don't really have the returns on how this in season tournament is going to go. But I think just from a structural standpoint, it's really strong and I'm really here for it. Gotcha. Well, cool. I was interested. I also didn't know what they won, if I'm being honest. Um, I did my research before and didn't look that up. So I'm interested to see that. And I, again, I think also, uh, you know, a lot of these guys are just so competitive, um, you know, and obviously some aren't. It's natural. Um, some are just it again. Some people, it is just their day job. But, you know, uh, 
athletes are some of the most competitive people on the planet. Their whole lives is competing against other people trying to be better. So having a little bit more of a prime time stage to do that, I think we're going to see a lot of maybe unsung heroes um, as well as, you know, guys trying to, like you said, guys on smaller deals trying to make some money, you know, they might get some better play out of them could be interesting and show teams, you know, what they have and some of the players they don't really know as much about. And again, it's early, but I would say the early returns have shown that that is true. Just watching kind of some of the games that were on that first Friday slate, as well as this most recent Tuesday and Friday. Uh, pardon me, I don't think there, were, there was a slate on Tuesday given election day, but this last Friday as well. It does seem like the teams that are playing are really going just an extra bit hard for what you know, a lot of times we would consider it to be just a typical regular season game. I think part of it is just even the concept being new to these teams, right? Not really knowing what's going on. Again, it just is something out of the ordinary that piques your interest just a little bit more than a regular Friday night might happen in the November days of the NBA season. So again, I applaud the NBA for doing it. And I really, I'm really interested to see particularly how the knockout rounds go. Once those teams are in, I wonder if they go even harder knowing that, hey, if we just win three games in a row here, all of a sudden we're going to have an extra 500000 dollars in the bank account and a trophy of some sort right and uh just given how much buying we've seen so far it doesn't feel like a participation trophy it does feel like something that will be earned so i'm super excited to see that play out no interesting i think that's you know like i said i i agree um i haven't watched as much basketball as i've been able to um but again i i have been tuning in those days so uh, i'm really interested by it and i'm curious to kind of see um, as well as kind of how it reflects contenders, you know, if maybe this is a good way to gauge early contenders. And speaking on that, um, we're going to segue into our thoughts on some of the top contenders this league. Who do we think are legit and uh, who do we think aren't? Now, I will say before we talk about this, um, at the beginning of the season, I was really high on the Clippers last. I was not high on the Clippers last year, but after seeing what Russell Westbrook did without Kawhi and Paul George, I was real big on him. And then I put a bet in for the uh, on DraftKings to say, I think they're going to win it all because they were at like plus 1200 or something. Um, I was really excited about that. Um, and then they traded for James Harden in one of, the, I think, the more confusing moves uh, in the NBA. I really don't understand what they thought another ball dominant player would do on that roster. And we're seeing that. So I just want to say, uh, I really have no clue uh, about anything going on. So that's why uh, you're our NBA expert. But going into this, I think we're just going to start with some of the, the better teams in the league right now and starting with that. Let's go first with the champions last year, Denver Nuggets. Wilson. What do you think of them as a contender again this year? Yeah, absolutely. The Nuggets, you know, every regular, excuse me, every NBA champion that is coming off of winning the championship gets the benefit of the doubt early on in the regular season following that championship run. And what I have been most impressed with Denver is how locked in they've been. Denver is essentially unbeatable at home. Their home record over the last couple of years has been so gaudy. And a lot of that is chalked up to just the elevation, right? Players aren't used to playing at that higher elevation. And, you know, a lot is said about the conditioning as well as just the environment of going up to Colorado and playing there. But that being said, I also think good teams just tend to win at home. And that's what we see with Denver. The role players are locked in night in, night out. I think Michael Malone has done an incredible job the last couple of years of getting buy-in and consistency out of his players. And they also just benefit from having the most nonchalant superstar the NBA might have ever seen in Nikola Jokic, where it really seems like he treats the NBA and winning basketball games as just his side hustle, where his, you know, his true passion is being back home. And you know, I think it, it's a little frustrating to me at times almost to see someone who can feel so lackluster and lackadaisical in his kind of how he goes about playing basketball to be so dominant at the same time. I have nothing but respect for the way he's able to dominate games with that pass first mentality. That being said, I don't know if I personally am sold as Denver as a true, true favorite to win the title. I do think they're a contender. I don't know if I would call them the favorite. Their bench has been good this year. I do think the losses of guys like Bruce Bowen, excuse me, Bruce Brown do play a, a large role just in how pivotal he was both as a six man, as well as an occasional starter for them. So um, I'm not quite sold on Denver, but I think they are among the contenders. Yeah, I kind of mirror what you're saying, especially now seeing, you know, Bruce Brown being a starter on the Pacers, having a really good year. You're really just kind of seeing what he was, you know, and what he can be uh, with a more expanded role. And also, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but Jamal Murray's out for a little bit of time here, correct? Yep, about a month. Yeah. So obviously, again, to still be eight and two at that is f and fantastic for them. But again, you know, it's always difficult guys coming in late with injuries, you know, trying to plug them and play them. I know Jamal Murray is obviously a very good player, but I think that's kind of what's most interesting to me is seeing, you know, when he gets in, will they struggle a little bit or will it just be right back to business? So I think that's kind of, um, you know, what I'm most interested in with them. Absolutely. And then for our next team, we are going on to the Celtics. Now, this is a team I kind of thought was going to be really good. Um, I hate Boston sports. I'm an Indiana sports fan, so a lot of torment there. 
but uh, obviously really talented roster. Only thing I'm really concerned about is kind of the, you know, sort of too many cooks in the kitchen moniker. A lot of, again, great players with the ball in their hand. Jalen Brown, Drew Holiday, Chris Daps Porzingis, Jason Tatum. So a lot of guys who need the ball. Um, and obviously you don't want to shadow Derek White, one of the more underrated players in the league as a whole, I think. So uh, I'm just curious, you know, they're doing good right now. But Wilson, what are your kind of thoughts on them being a contender? Again, this might be an odd stance to take on a team that on paper has so much talent, but to me, I still question the fen- excuse me, the fit to an extent, and you mentioned kind of having too many ball handler- handlers on the court at the same time. I think there's still kind of a lack of established hierarchy. People generally recognize Tatum as the best player, but he isn't as consistent as some of the other best players in the league. When you look at, at a roster such as Milwaukee or the Sixers or even Denver, Jokic, Giannis, and Embiid are clearly the best player on their team every single night, and that's not the case with Tatum. There are a- There are occasional nights and frequent nights even where guys like Jalen Brown or even, you know, Porzingis might have a night where they look like the best player on the court. And that can be a good problem to have, right? When you're able to kind of rotate who that number one option is, there's, it offers flexibility. And if Tatum does have an off night, they can kind of expect other guys to kind of rally around him and, and, and kind of put in the, uh, put in the points if the offense is struggling. That being said, I think there's a little bit of a lack of identity there. And I think that's been the problem with Boston for the last couple of years. They continue to run the same thing over and over again. And again, on paper, the talent is there. But to me, it reminds me a little bit of the Buffalo Bills, where that McDermott and Allen pairing has been run so many times. You know, the defense, people always love to tell on the defensive side of the ball. And they have good enough weapons. And Allen is just one of the superstars in the league, but they've never been able to get over the hump. And to me, I would equate the Boston Celtics of the last decade, or excuse me, that last half decade or so to that of the Bills. I just don't think, I think their peak might be behind them is what I would say. Interesting. Yeah, I will say I was never huge on Jason Tatum. I thought he's very talented. Last year, though, he really cemented me, in my opinion, as a top tier player. Um, And so I have been a little surprised by his again, I say fall off, he's having three less points a game. But like you said, I think he's just kind of trying to get back to trying to show that he is the guy. And I think that's what uh, all these acquisitions might have caused an issue with. And again, they're seven and two, so it's fine. But um, I think that's that to me is the most interesting dynamic because I finally thought he broke through and is like, all right, I'm the guy, right? Especially in the playoffs, all the big moments, 50 point playoff games, he was just balling out. And now it's kind of back to, again, still a fantastic player. But just like you said, I think the lack of a stab, excuse me, lack of an established power dynamic, I think is what is one of their biggest issues. And I would also add, Interesting comparison here, but I wonder if the competitive stamina of Tatum is similar to that of Anthony Davis, where we see the way Anthony Davis can dominate basketball games on both sides of the court. And while I think he's quite consistent on the defensive end, Anthony Davis has plenty of days where he's a no-show on offense, and it really affects the Lakers' ability to be a true contender over the last couple of years. The year that they did win the title... It was partially on the back of LeBron. LeBron was still the number one unquestioned option on that on that team. And I also think that three, four month hiatus away from the game did well to help a guy like Anthony Davis, not just from a health standpoint, but also from just having to be competitive day in and day out, going to the bubble where the only thing to focus on was basketball. We kind of saw that environment really aid the Lakers in their in their title run there. And AD was super, super locked in. I wonder if we have a similar dynamic there with Tatum. I, I wouldn't go so far to say that he he lacks competitive spirit, but I think he lacks competitive consistency. Interesting. Okay. Well, I think with that, then we'll transition into our second to last team we were going to talk about, and that is your Sixers. Obviously, with the James Harden trade, Tyrese Maxey has really stepped into that number two role, and I think he's flourishing, and it had a 50-point game tonight on the 12th of November, um, and really just showing what he can be while on top of all averaging, I think, about eight assists a game. So, really talented player, and coming into his own, Wilson, what do you think about your Sixers going forward? Yeah, you really sold me last year on the Harden acquisition. I had been sour on Harden as a player, both just individually as well as just team fit. It really wasn't my style of basketball, and I didn't think it was conducive to winning. But over the course of the last two years particularly, I think you really sold me on Harden's ability to impact winning. And I really bought into what Harden was offering the Sixers. I loved the two-man game that they played. And you know, particularly when Embiid was out, Harden had some fantastic performances for the Sixers. That being said, I would counter that with I think we've seen a little bit of addition by subtraction traction this year with the Sixers. I think losing Harden away from that team, just the distraction that had become knowing that he didn't want to be a part of a Moray roster, I think has really contributed to the success of this team. I think the chemistry is better. I think the acquisition of Nick Nurse has the players buying into a completely different style of play and a completely different system. And the Sixers just look like one of the most dominant two two side, uh, excuse me, two-way teams in the NBA right now. The offense has been clicking on all cylinders. Embiid and Maxi lead all scoring duos, which I think 
Embiid is obviously, you know, almost a guaranteed 30 points at this point. You would expect him to be up there, but for Maxi to kind of average that mid to even high 20s early on in the season has been super, super impressive to see. And he's really established himself as a legit number two offense, uh, excuse me, offensive option. Additionally, I think that Maury's done a good job to fill out the roster with the role players. Rocco bringing him back to the city of brotherly love, as well as guys like Nick Batum and Kelly Oubre, obviously. Um, I don't know if you saw on the news, this just came up yesterday, but he had, he had, uh, was the victim of a hit and run. So super sad to see the loss of Ubre for a significant part of the season is what the reports have been saying. But again, Ubre had been playing so well up to that point. And I think it's all about buying into this new system. Obviously, Nick Nurse is a proven head coach. And I think while his voice may have run dry a little bit in Toronto, I think his voice has not fallen on deaf ears so far in Philadelphia. And the results, excuse me, the results early on have been promising. Again, I acknowledge I'm a little biased as a Sixers fan, but this is the most promise I felt, um, which is weird to say because it almost feels like one of the least talented rivals we've had over the last five years yeah and no, i think it's interesting but again i think just with harden in that team especially um again i know we both are not doc rivers fans uh, as a head coach i just have always think he's been carried by talent and once again i think the lack of adjustments i think that's really what soured the uh harden dynamic and uh, as well as you know him and Embiid, because you saw when Embiid was out like you said james harden had some massive games and it's like, okay, so then why is he struggling to do that with Embiid in? You know, he's still, if he has the hot hand, he should be riding it. But that just wasn't how the team was working. That being said, like you said, Nick Nurse has won a championship recently with the Raptors. I wasn't the biggest fan of him, but that was just because of, I think, more of the management's love of Pascal Siakam, and I don't buy him as a number one. Uh, but again, I thought he's a great coach, and I thought it was a great hire by them. Uh, also, I think someone you didn't mention I was kind of surprised by is Tobias Harris having an extremely efficient year. I think Harden being out has given him the ball a little more, especially with the second team units where you would kind of see Harden sometimes get run out. And um, I think he's finally starting to play to his contract in terms of, you know, he has kind of a gaudy contract, but I think he's finally now getting to playing just some really, really elite basketball. I mean, he's averaging 20 points a game um, and just all around good basketball by him. So uh, I think that's, it's, very cool to see again, like you said, with Kelly Oubre as well, thoughts and prayers out to him, but I mean, he was having a fantastic year as well. So it's a real shame to see him get injured, especially because, you know, um, a lot of these guys, when they get put in these positions where they can ball out a little more, um, you see them get big contracts and get what they deserve. So obviously very disappointed by that, but I do think, yeah, when he comes back, this is a roster that has, like you said, maybe not the most talented over the last few years, but, um, I think what it finally has is a head coach who's competent and will make adjustments to try and feed who has the hot hand. Like with Tyrese Maxey having 50, uh, there was just no reason James Harden should have ever not been able to do that, you know, when Embiid was having a sort of off night. And I was always real confused by that. So glad to see them kind of get that sorted out um, as well as, you know, just feeding the hot hand. I mean, Uber had some big games for him too. So uh, I'd love to see that. Thank you for bringing up. Uh, Tobias Harris, just real quickly here. Harris, his kind of ascension to that third rule again has really resurrected his play for the Sixers. And again, it's one of those interesting things where it almost feels like addition by subtraction, where I used to say that Harris was one of the best fourth options in the league, but in a way that's hindering his ability, right? Harris really has the talent and the skill set and the size of a player that should be the second or third best player on a championship level team. And getting elevated back to that third position on the roster and kind of the offensive um uh, hierarchy, I think has really just increased his level of play. You know, I've seen, we've seen a revised commitment and he's always been committed to the Sixers, but I think he's got a renewed energy on both sides of the ball. And I've really loved to see that so far. No, that's interesting. And then for our last team, we're talking about an old classic, um, a team that shook up its roster this year and the experience I think has been a little worse than they'd hope, but obviously still a storied franchise and that's the Warriors. Wilson, what are your takes on them? Yeah, Drake's favorite team to talk about here, the Golden State Warriors. Um, you know, I think early on in the season, I was impressed with their ability to win on the road. That being said, losing to the Cavs at home is not what you expect to see out of a team that has so many veterans and had been playing so well early on in the season. The Chris Ball experiment is an interesting one. I think what's the kind of brutal reality for the Warriors going into the season and kind of throughout the season is going to be, what is their willingness to the role they're willing to give to Chris Paul. I think as a backup point guard, he's elite, but I don't think he's a 25 to 30 minute a game player for them. And that's what he's been so far to them. And I think they're a relying on him a little bit too much and B understating some of the limitations he has just with this age. He's obviously not a good defender anymore. And truly his ability to score has been greatly diminished over the last couple of years. Obviously the assist to turnover ratio is incredible. And for a roster that's notorious for their turnovers, he's really been able to calm down that offense at points. But I also think kind of the risks and the fast pace of the Warriors is what's made them the Warriors over the last couple of years. And having this completely different contrasting style of play it's benefited them at times, I think, again, on the road. I think we see that lower turnover play really assist them and their ability to pull out some wins. But it has taken two 
buzzer beater wins for the Warriors to be over 500. You know, take out those two buzzer beater games, call them 50 50 games, and the Warriors are sitting at 500 again. I'm higher on this roster than I was last year, which is a little interesting to say, considering I thought the Warriors were a true contender last year. But I think they're, they are going to have to make some moves along the edges and really reconsider how they want the role of Chris Paul to be on this team in order for them to truly, truly contend with the elite in the West. Yeah, so I was, um, I think really all I have to say about them is it's so impressive to me how Steph Curry is continuing to, in my opinion, elevate his game uh, at 35 years old, especially after, again, as a young player, kind of struggling to get on the court, struggle with some foot injuries. You know, he wears those funky Steph Curry Under Armour shoes because he needs that support. But um, I was kind of a Steph Curry hater until the 2020 season when he really put the team on his back and showed that he can do that, right? It wasn't just an amazing team around him. As And as Clay Thompson has regressed, I think seeing him still ball out also shows, again, even though he's not an amazing defender, uh, what he brings on the offensive side is one of a kind. And again, I've gone on record saying I think he's the greatest point guard of all time. And I think all this, you know, these most recent years have been is just, just him reinstating that uh, he just scores at such a high clip. And it just seems so easy, I think, is what's so interesting about it. But, um, again, my, my hat's off to Steph Curry. Um, turned me into a fan. So I might not like the Warriors because I have to watch them every single night at 1030 because they're the only game that ever gets primetime games. But um, I will say I'm a big fan of Steph Curry. Yeah, one follow up, one follow up point about Steph, and then one team. Uh, excuse me, one point about some of the older players in the league. The point about Steph is quietly this year, Steph has been the only elite player on that Warriors roster. Um, Warriors to score over twenty points in a game, only Steph Curry's done it. No twenty point plus performance from Clay, Wiggins, even CP. No one's been able to do it. Um, and I think that's truly an indictment on the play of the rest of the roster, considering kind of the hot start that the Warriors got off to. Secondly, just to your point about Steph's ability to age, I think what Kevin Durant, LeBron James, and Steph Curry, those three in particular are doing this year, has really kind of in our minds changed what we expect older players to be able to do. LeBron is the oldest player in the NBA, NBA this year, not the oldest player that get, gets minutes, the oldest player. And for him to truly be playing at the level of a top 10 player for Steph, KD, and LeBron, all to be arguably top eight players thus far into the season. It's just a testament to how well they've taken care of their bodies, as well as just the skill sets they've been able to acquire given their time in the NBA. And I think in a couple of years, we're going to look at it and realize that that's not the new standard. It's really just the three of them being being freaks of nature, it's just in their process and how they go about the game. And I have nothing but respect for it. It's truly incredible to see, and I'm glad we're alive to witness it. No, me too. I agree. And with that, we will our B segment will come to our close. And for our last segment, we will kind of talk about some of the young QBs and their long term fit with their current rosters. Welcome back in to the B sides of sports to close out our podcast this week. We wanted to talk about some of the younger quarterbacks in the league, particularly those on some of the legacy franchises within the NFL. And we're going to play a short game here for Drake called how much stock are you putting in this QB? So just considering the long-term implications of these players, whether or not they're the right fit for the roster moving forward and whether or not they can truly build a true contender centered around these guys under center. So we're going to start with the Pittsburgh Steelers. They have had Kenny Pickett. Obviously Pickett has had some really, really horrendous starts to games, but he's been able to pull out a couple of drives late in these fourth quarters. So an interesting dichotomy here. Let's start with Kenny Pickett. Okay. Not big on Pickett. I'm just going to keep that straight up. I think he has a good roster around him. Obviously George Pickens is a freak of nature. He's a diva. That's just what Pittsburgh does. Uh, I love Deontay Johnson. Always been a fan of him when he isn't dropping the football, the football, the football. I truly think he's one of the better talents in the league. Um, in terms of just getting open, getting enough separation to make a catch. He's a great reception guy. Uh, Jalen Warren, one of the best undrafted free agents in the league, I'd say right now. I mean, really just being a true 1A, 1B type system with Najee Harris. Again, another great back. And I get his O-line's had some struggles, but you cannot be averaging under less than one passing touchdown a game with a coach like Mike Tomlin. I get that he's a defensive coach, but Ben Roethlisberger for years. Again, again, another guy I wasn't big on. I don't think he was, you know, anything transcendent, kind of in that Eli Manning category. But I mean, again, he had great weapons around him and he at least took advantage of them. I mean, George Pickens not getting the ball, Deontay Johnson barely getting the ball. They should have lost this game today. If their defense isn't a Pittsburgh Steelers defense, they lose. I'm out on him. I think if I'm then, I'm trying to figure out other options. I think you can write him out on his rookie deal, see what you can do. But um, I think come year four, uh, if you haven't seen significant steps up, I think you have to move on. I'm with you here, and it's truly a testament to just Tomlin and the overall Pittsburgh roster to be sitting at six and three. The quarter, his quarterback play has truly been abysmal this year, and they don't really have a good backup option. So I think they're going to ride it out this season. I think you've got to just see what you have. Um, but yeah, I'm I'm pretty low here on my stock with Pickett too. 
We'll move on to the San Francisco 49ers and obviously the fin, uh, the phenom here, some would say, Brock Purdy. A lot of up and down for Purdy over the last couple of weeks. We know he had that really hot start to just his overall NFL career. Being the last pick in that draft, really low expectations, obviously superseded those. That being said, we've seen some of his limitations over the last couple of weeks. They got back on track today, but he did have his full all-star squad of weapons available to him. What do you think of Purdy and his long-term implications? So... I, I still don't think we have enough on Purdy, in my opinion, but I will say it, it's so funny because he'll impress me one week and then the next week I'm like, ooh, I don't know if, you know, he is the option, you know, and again, I, I understand they know what he is, but again, Patriots won so many championships with a guy like Tom Brady, who his physicals were pretty terrible. Brock Purdy kind of has a weak arm. Again, Peyton Manning had that. Drew, Drew Brees obviously had a big arm, but he was super accurate, right? So that's kind of what Purdy kind of falls into for me is uh, Drew Brees because Brees always had great weapons in New Orleans and continued to ball out. So even though his lack of size or, again, you know, his deep ball left him pretty late, they still were a solid roster. So I kind of look at Purdy like this sort of, you know, there's a reason he was drafted last overall. But also, I look at a guy like Trevor Lawrence, and I'm like, he was drafted first overall because we got to see him a ton, and he's the perfect athletic profile. But really, he's just really strong, really tall, really fast Case Keenum. And so I think what Purdy is, though, is he has, in my opinion, more of a winner's mindset than Trevor Lawrence. Trevor Lawrence, again, he's never the guy in the middle of the huddle yelling at his guys, telling him to play better. But what Brock Purdy does is he knows his role. And he stays in that and he's making good reads week in and week out. But then again, like I said, he'll unimpress me. But if I'm being honest, I'm not huge on a guy like Trevor Lawrence still as being the option. And that's just because I really need proof before I'll buy into someone. And I think that's kind of where I'm at with Purdy. I just still need proof that he can be that guy, right? Play from behind and win some games. And then I think I can buy into him. Yeah, and it's interesting. There's a lot made about just being in that Shanahan, Shanahan offense, right? A lot of people want to give him the benefit of the doubt. The truth is Shanahan's record when being down going into the fourth quarter, I think within um, a score more, so seven plus going into the fourth, he's something like one in 37. Shanahan's teams are unable to win in a deficit going into the fourth. And it does, to an extent, speak about speak to the quarterback talent he's had at that position. But I also think it speaks to the scheme. And when you look at a guy like Brock Purdy that does have some of those physical limitations, I think you can have all the intangibles in the world. If you can't make a throw, you can't make a throw. And I think he's going to be, he's, excuse me, we've seen him be asked to make some of those throws over the last couple of weeks, and he hasn't been able to deliver a lot of late picks in the fourth quarters. Um, so I'm with you too. I think we do need a little bit of a, a larger bit of a sample size, but I don't think he's necessarily the franchise quarterback moving forward. We'll move on to Mac Jones of the Patriots. Mac is obviously a guy that we have a much larger sample size with. Um, year three now with the Patriots. And obviously the results have been a kind of in a downward spiral for the Patriots. They are sitting at two and eight, not the best record. And the play of Jones has not been spectacular to say the least. What do you think of Jones? So again, I'm, I, I'm not trying to, it's hard for me because I don't know if there's a less talented receiver core in the NFL than the Patriots. But his attitude and sort of the issues with the team are what concern me most. I think he's a guy who needs to grow up more than anything. I think, again, we saw his rookie year. That was a very impressive season for a rookie, in my opinion. To have almost 4,000 yards, 22 touchdowns, uh, really solid year, you know, almost 100 quarterback rating. And then he struggled since then. But I don't think the Patriots have put him in a position to succeed. Um, and with that being said, again, I still think the attitude issues and, you know, having players come up to you on your own team and talk about the sort of cheap shots you do, I think just kind of shows, I think he needs a change of scenery, but I don't think he's the Patriots option. Um, again, I think he could be a starter somewhere and be maybe a quality starter, but I just do not think it's with the Patriots. Yeah. And I also think, you know, just he was coming out of Alabama. He was a guy that was heralded to have a super high floor and somewhat of a limited ceiling. Right. And I think when you look at a franchise like the Patriots and you might view this a little bit differently than me, but I think if, if the, they've kind of let him take the reins a bit more this year, right. They've allowed him to throw the deep ball a little bit more frequently. And again, this could be chalked up to just kind of the lack of talent at that skill positions. Um, but it's the results have been a little poor in my opinion, a lot of ugly picks, not a lot of touchdowns, kind of an inability to convert on third down, especially when it's third and long. And obviously it's not an easy position for any quarterback, but to see the regression from that first year is a little bit concerning to me and why I don't think he is the Patriots guy moving forward. The final uh, quarterback we'll talk about today here, um, and to me, I think is the most intriguing one, kind of the one that has both the highest ceiling and the lowest floor, that is Jordan Love for the Green Bay Packers. And, you know, the Packers have been letting him let it rip this year. He's thrown a lot of deep passes. He's had a really poor completion percentage. But I think it's how you should embrace the young quarterback. What are your thoughts here? So 
I've always been uh, critical of Matt LaFleur. We didn't really have the podcast uh, for the last few years, but when you have Aaron Rodgers and a very, excuse me, um, a very talented receiver core, and you can't win games with Aaron Jones, talented old line, good defense. I think a lot of that falls on the head coach. And I think that's what we're seeing with Jordan Love. Really talented playmakers with Christian Watson, Romeo Dobbs, Aaron Jones, AJ Dillon, uh, that Demary Wicks kid. I, I really like him. Stupid fast. They have a really bunch of really good playmakers, but to me, it really just feels like, again, you look at their first half performances, especially they just like, don't do anything. And then in the second half, Jordan loves a lot better player. It's like, it takes Matt before getting his teeth pushed in before he makes adjustment adjustments. And I think that's the issue. And I will admit Aaron Jones has been hurt for a lot of the year and he's a very integral part of that offense, but still, um, I think my thing with love, honestly, is I just want him to see him not with Matt LaFleur, because like you said, I think he has a very high ceiling and a very low floor. And I just don't think Matt LaFleur is getting the most out of that. He did well with very established talent. And now with non established talent, he's struggling tremendously. Not even th- a quarterback who throws at 60% with, in my opinion, one of the more slept on receiver cores in the league. So um, I'm still buying into Jordan Love potentially as a career starter, but I do not buy into Matt LaFleur as a longtime option for Green Bay. I love your point about LaFleur and particularly the slow starts that Green Bay has had in their first half of games. You know, you see a lot of NFL coaches come into those games with scripted plays, right? Whether it's the first eight, the first 10, the first series, they know exactly what they want their offense to do when they get on that field. And for Green Bay to essentially be unable to generate any type of offense in the first half of these games, and then once the second half rolls around, all of a sudden the ball gets rolling and they're able to score almost that will at times throughout these games. I think it speaks to the off scriptedness of how Love is able to play whether he's down, whether it's under the chaos, whether it's under the pressure, and really how l- the lack of preparedness that the overall roster has going into the game. It's really an indictment on the floor. And he's a guy that I've liked over the last couple of years, but I'm a little lower on this year, particularly just with his management of a young quarterback. And I think your point about that is just excellent. I think um, it would be super interesting to see Jordan Love with a different, not just a head coach, but a different OC as well. Yeah, yeah, I've always kind of held the belief that I don't think a head co- coach is ever more important than a franchise QB in terms of a franchise QB. If he truly is one, um, he will be that guy no matter who's behind him. Um, meanwhile, a head coach will good head coaches don't necessarily always win um, when they don't have a franchise guy. So I think it's an interesting dichotomy. But again, I'm just not big on LaFleur, but I think love has all the tools. And like you said, I just think it comes down more to preparedness. And again, just get the ball in the hands of your playmakers. That comes down to coaching, right? I mean, you can scheme up a throw for Watson all you want, but just get him the ball sh- short, right? Give him an end around, give him something. And I just, I don't think they're doing that. <clears throat> great point, great point. That'll wrap our episode six of season three of the B-Sides of Sports. Drake and I, as always, thank you guys for tuning in. If you've made it this far in the podcast, we really appreciate the support. And we're going to continue to grind this thing out. You know, we are truly in the halfway season of the nfl season we're jumping into the nba so we've got a lot of, a lot of exciting content on deck we've launched our tiktok recently so if you haven't seen those please go check it out on our tiktok page just the b-sides of sports and we'll see you again soon here link will be in the description for the tiktok by the way